Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for Age, Agency and Joy, the first public event of the Design Age Institute at the Royal College of Art. We have more than 650 people registered for this event, an amazing global response, which just goes to show how much design matters to all of us as we age. I'm Jeremy Myerson, I'm speaking to you from London, and I hold the Helen Hamlin Chair of Design at the RCA. I'm the co-founder and former director of the Helen Hamlin Center for Design, under whose wing the new institute has been hatched. And it's my privilege to be chairing this opening session. Now, I've been involved in the field of aging and design for a long time, and probably by now my own case study, but I can honestly say I've never felt more optimistic and excited than I do today about the new venture we're going to present. But I'm gonna to have to curb my enthusiasm for just a few minutes. And before we start, I want to introduce Victoria Patrick, Impact Manager of the Design Age Institute to share a bit of housekeeping. Victoria. Thank you, Jeremy. Yes, just wanted to share a couple of quick housekeeping things. So this is a Zoom webinar session which means you will be able to contribute through the Q&A function during the panel discussion later, later in the session. We will also be sharing a couple of Google Forms in the chat to gather your input throughout. This will include a short feedback form at the end of the session. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Auto closed captioning is available and this session is being recorded. Back to you, Jeremy. Well, thank you, uh, Victoria. Now, if the name Design Age has a familiar ring to some of you, that's because you've heard it before in the context of the Royal College of Art. Exactly 30 years ago in 1991, the Design Age Research Programme was launched at the RCA with the support of Helen Hamlin and her charitable foundation. The director was Roger Coleman, and during the 1990s, Design Age did some fantastic work to bring the issue to international attention. So effective was Design Age in mobilizing designers that in 1998, it became the fully fledged Helen Hamlin Center for Design, which continued to develop the focus on inclusive design and is today the lead body responsible for setting up the new Design Age Institute. So while we're celebrating something new, we're also circling back 30 years and celebrating three decades of continuous and visionary support for design research at the college by the Helen Hamlin Trust. Such a stretch of unbroken philanthropy is remarkable by any standards. And I'm delighted that Lady Hamlin herself is with us this morning, along with Dr. Paul Thompson, Vice Chancellor of the Royal College of Art. And you're gonna hear from them both shortly. Today is all about bringing together designers, service providers, care professionals, and academics to talk about design for the healthy aging economy. Our context is the UK's government's grand challenge on aging. Today is all about connection and collaboration, and we hope to work with many of you as we build a community of practice. You're gonna hear from the Institute's team of experts on their plans and program, and you're gonna meet our incredible partners in this initiative. Our funding from Research England allows a new landscape with new linkages to be formed and not even a global pandemic, which has incidentally highlighted the vulnerability of older people and the urgent need for innovation has been allowed to stand in our way. Aside from introducing ourselves, we also want to hear from you. We want to share your perspectives throughout this event. Age, agency, and joy are three deliberately chosen words at the core of the Design Age Institute's vision and values. We believe that design can help people to continue to experience what brings joy to their lives as they age. Before this event, you were all invited to think about an object or activity in your home or neighborhood that brings you joy. We have already started collecting these objects, but if you've not submitted your own object of joy, I'll give you a couple of minutes to click the link in chat 
if, you, if you've not already added something. In the meantime, I'm pleased to introduce the designer, Ava Oosterlaken, a 2020 RCA graduate in global innovation design. Ava is going to create a visual collection of these joyful objects that we will share with you after the event. Ava, tell us a little bit about what you're planning to do. Thank you so much, Jeremy, um, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm super pleased to uh, be here and join you all this morning. Um, it's a great day, <laughs> great to hear about uh, the launching of the Design Age Institutes. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce myself. I'm a design researcher and visual designer. Um, my practice is about creating spaces for others to create and imagine future possibilities. Uh, for today's event, I'll be capturing your contributions to the event into a series of visualizations. So thank you already for sharing all your objects of joy and continuing to share. These have been super great to read through so far, um, and they will inspire the first visualization that I'll share later this morning. Um, I'll also be listening along to the event and capturing the essence of the event theme, age, agency, and joy. Great. Well, thank you, Ava. We look forward to checking in with you later to see how the collection is developing. So now I'd like to introduce the Royal College of Arts Vice Chancellor, Dr. Paul Thompson, to set the context for this event. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I, I've done quite a few of these um, talks with, uh, with, at the RCA on Zoom, just about getting used to um, pressing unmute. I have to say, I've never been on a, um, uh, on, a, on a conference webinar with so many people before the RCA. This is, this is a record, a Zoom record for the RCA to have so many of you on board. Um, it's a real pleasure and very, very exciting, as Jeremy said to actually have, um, you know, design, age, uh, agency, joy, um, capturing everybody's imagination. I think the, the use of the word joy is so important. And actually, I was, I was very pleased to see in the, in the paper this morning um, that there's an exhibition by the 92-year-old Japanese artist, um, Yayoi Kasama, um, that's just opened in New York, and the exhibition is described as an explosion of joy. And how wonderful to, um, in these kind of COVID times, to open a newspaper and actually see an exhibition installation in New York Botanical Gardens by a 92-year-old um, artist. Uh, it, 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 to, to me, that sort of set the whole scene for, for, for me uh, and, and the day. As Jeremy said, the establishment of the Design Age Institute really does represent a major milestone in, um, in, in a world leading um, research intensive university like the Royal College of Art. Um, the, the project has been uh, funded by the UK Research and Innovation um, Body, which means it, it's, it's a government um, seal of imprimatur of, of approval, which is terrific. And as Jeremy also said, it is um, an, a, a very golden egg that has been nested um, and, and has hatched within an extremely important research centre at the RCA, our oldest, um, largest um, research centre looking at, at, at ageing and design inclusivity, the Helen Hamlin Centre. I think all of us would agree that um, the Design Age Institute could not come at a better moment. Um, we hear talk of, uh, you know, a, 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 an impending government review on COVID um, pandemic, uh, we know undoubtedly that a lot of fingers um, and, and lessons will be learned, fingers pointed and lessons learned from the way in which um, we treated uh, older people, particularly older people in care homes, older people who are moved out of hospital, perhaps too soon, um, into other communities. Um, and that has been an extremely chilling uh, and chastening lesson for all of us. And it just reminds us about the need um, not only just to sort of protect um, and, and nurture uh, old, older people, but actually to kind of bear them in mind from point one of the process of, 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 of any um, national planning uh, emergency or, or otherwise. We really do need now, I think, a very vigorous national debate about how well we can support healthy, um, longer living um, in intergenerational housing, in the workplace, and of course, in our cities. 
And, and all of those topics have got to be um, discussed and borne in mind with, with older people um, really put at the center. We're pleased to welcome some very prestigious partners to join us with the Design Age Institute and the Helen Hamden Center for Design. Um, we have the Oxford Institute of Population Aging at Oxford University, which is uh, a, a wonderful um, partnership. We've actually been working with Sarah Harper there for, for, for several years, which is a, a great honor. Then, of course, the National Innovation Center for Aging at Newcastle University, NICA, and the International Longevity Centers. And of course, just down the road from where I'm sitting here in London, the Design Museum uh, is, is, is our sort of public disseminating partner. We're pleased to be joined by colleagues representing the DIA's Design Age Institute's partnerships, and, and you're going to be hearing from them later today. The centre is not going to be homeless. It's not going to live on Zoom, I promise you. It will, it will actually move into a purpose-built uh, new building down on our Battersea campus, designed by Herzog and de Meuron, um, and... Uh, we're very, very pleased that it will occupy a space, the Helen Hamlin um, Design Centre and uh, the Design Age Institute will be on, I believe, the fourth floor of the Rousing Building, um, which will be uh, down uh, on the Battersea campus and it opens um, really uh, in earnest um, in January 2022. But of course, the work of both the Design Age Institute, Helen Hamlin Centre continues apace um, in, in, in its current um, dwellings. Over the past 30 years, the RCA and the Helen, Design, Helen Hamlin Design Centre has led research and innovation in inclusive design. And the DIA is going to bring new talent, new energy, uh, and very much an industry focus um, aimed at SMEs in the UK, um, looking at how we can actually take great ideas um, and put them into production and then market them. Uh, and that, I think, uh, is, is, a, is a real challenge for us. It's a challenge we're really looking forward to. And we know that it will help uh, improve the lives of older people, not just in the UK, um, but around the world. So with that uh, preamble, if I may, I'm going to pass back to uh, Professor Myerson uh, and, to, uh, and, and ask him to introduce uh, Lady Hamlin, who, as Jeremy said, um, has been the most extraordinary stalwart um, advocate and pioneer in this field of um, design, age and inclusivity. Uh, such a pioneer that uh, we awarded her an honorary doctorate um, at the RCA um, in recognition of the work that she has done in this field. Thank you, Jeremy. Well, thank you very much indeed, Paul. Um, really exciting to get the institutional uh, context uh, around this exciting new development. Uh, it gives me great pleasure now to bring in uh, Helen Hamlin herself, um, uh, uh, to this forum. Uh, stay with us, Paul, because we're going to bring you back in as well. But I'd like to um, ask Helen a little bit about her involvement over, well, 35 years of, of championing um, the role of design in, the, in, in, in ageing and really signalling what demographic change is going to mean for designers. So Helen, welcome. And if I could start by asking you, you know, how did you first get involved with this issue and why did you decide to champion the cause of older people in industry and design? Good morning, Jeremy. Good morning, everybody. Oh, goodness me, that's a big question. Well, I think it was because uh, a, I was at the Royal College as a student from 1951 to 54 and realized what an absolutely extraordinary institute it was. Inspirational then, and even more inspirational now. So it set one on the right course to realize that design is uh, not superficial, it's fundamental. And so as I grew older, my mother grew older, demographic change was in the air. So my mother wasn't very well, and being the independent woman that she was, as the last suffragette, as she always told me, um, she wanted to stay at home. So I started looking at what the was to help her to stay at home in an elegant, independent way. And lo and behold, what did I find? Absolutely nothing. 
that was really attractive or practical or well designed to help her. So, of course, we had to do something about it. And so, as I happen to know, a lot of uh, wonderful and globally known um, industrial designers, I said to them, don't you think it would be a good idea to um, do an exhibition of designs to help other people live more comfortably in their own homes, um, rather than being shifted off to a care home, which wasn't much fun for anyone? And I had an extraordinary response, uh, firstly, from my friend uh, David Meller, the great designer um, who was also at college with me, who said, well, Helen, designing for children, yes. Older people? I don't know. So I said, come on, David, we're all getting to get older. So he said eventually, yes. And then we were joined by the gurus of design in America, Leila and Massimo uh, Vignelli, and then many others, some of the old uh, college uh, you know, people and some uh, international ones. And this exhibition was got together, thanks to Terence Conran at the Boiler House. And um, was amazingly successful. In fact, I think it was, it, it was incredible. I remember I was just 30 years old when I saw it in 1986. And uh, um, I remember going to the Boiler House Gallery at the V&A and, mm. and it was totally against the grain of the time. It was a period of conspicuous consumption. Design was aimed at younger people. Here was this exhibition, Helen. Um, uh, were you surprised at the response that you got, both from the media, the design profession, uh, and of course the Royal College of Arts sat up and took <laughs> Well, of course, I, I mean, firstly, I was very happily surprised. But I think, secondly, the most important thing is one realised how necessary this was. This was something that was waiting to happen. And... Um, as I'd been very fortunate that my husband, Paul Hamlin, um, had given me my own foundation uh, for my 50th birthday present. No diamonds, just a foundation and the wise words, well, darling, you're always saying what you want to do. Now get on and do it. So um, because I've always had wonderful relationships with the Royal College, I thought we'd ask them and um, if they would like to set up a small, at that time, um, part of the college to study design for ageing, relating to all the different parts of ageing. In other words, not only um, simple things, but homes and, and the whole transport, everything to do with how you could grow older in a more healthy way. So um, fortunately, uh, wonderful Christopher Frailing uh, was very much in favour. So, and we found Roger Coleman, who was absolutely perfect for this role. And off we went. And that was, I think, in what, 1991? Exactly 30 years ago. Yes. And of course, in those days, I was 30 years younger, like you, Jeremy. And um, but we were very ambitious and wanted to show that design for older people was equally, I won't say more important, but certainly equally important to design for younger people. And Roger went ahead like a steam engine and he put in for and won one of the Queen's uh, awards for higher education, which is the first Queen's award. And the college was in shock. How could a small little add-on designed for ageing suddenly become the only part of the college that was all of a sudden world famous? So I think all the professors sat up and took notice. And from then on, everybody at college has been involved in helping um, the, the centre to grow, um, for which um, you are vastly responsible, having been there for how many years now? Oh, I've not, I've not counting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, because you, you, you're not somebody who lives in the past, and although you've been responsible for catalyzing a lot of design in the ageing uh, arena, um, I was going to ask, what are the things that you uh, 
uh, see today that upset you around design for older people? Which are the which are the designs you'd like the new institute to really have a crack at? <laughs> well, let me tell you, there are many things that upset me, but one thing which really, really upsets me is that sort of object which is called a walker, which older people are given extensively to help them walk around, which I think is the most degrading object you could give to anybody. And if I may, Jeremy, I would like to take this opportunity to offer a personal prize of, what should we say, £5,000 to someone, some designer or even someone who isn't officially a designer who can come up with an elegant, usable something um, to replace this ghastly thing that everybody's given now that will make people feel better and not worse. So that is certainly number one in my book. Right. Okay, you heard it here first, everybody. There's five thousand pounds <laughs> on the table uh, from Lady Hamlin um, to um, let's rethink the Walker. Um, absolutely, that's where I'm putting it. Yeah. I mean, Helen, one of the roles of the uh, um, new institute is to address stereotypes around aging. Um, do you think that attitudes have got to change and not just products and services? Yes, uh, of course they do, Jeremy. Unfortunately, we've lived in the power of sense of war, I suppose, really, in, in an age which is obsessed with youth. And, you know, there's something for a child before it's even born. Children very often are very spoiled. And older people are looked upon as, you know, what are they doing around here? You know, why don't they just give up and die or something? Which is horrendous. And I think COVID has shown up. The, the, the government attitudes have to change. And we have to, if I dare say it, force the government to change its attitude by showing publicly as much as we can that it isn't necessary for people to get older in bad health. Of course, a lot of it depends on personal discipline and, um, you know, a reasonable way of living. But I think attitudes haven't helped. They have to change. And we're going to help change them, aren't we, as we have in the past. And uh, with the new Design Age Institute, which I'm immensely proud of, because it's grown out of 30 years of the really hard work from uh, my centre by everyone there, not only the professors, but all the graduate students and the teachers there, to put design, healthy living design, design for our future selves, out there so that people can actually re relate and respond to it. So um, hopefully we'll be doing even more than that with the with the new centre in its beautiful new surroundings. My goodness, aren't they lucky? And I think it's a huge tribute to the centre for having grown so much and matured to have got this accolade and I'm sure we'll make the very best use of it. Great. Um, I'm going to bring uh, uh, Dr. Paul Thompson back in because talk of the new Battersea Research Building uh, I think is very, very important. Um, Paul, you mentioned this, this rousing research center um, as the new home for the Helen Hamlin uh, Center for Design, <laughs> and also the new institute. Can you tell us a little bit about the background to the building? How do you create an innovation tower and what are the kind of things that's gonna go on there? Well, I think it, it, it's a good question. I, I think what, what we wanted to do was actually uh, the RCA was, to look at actually the success of the Helen Hamlin Center for Design and say, okay, what other areas um, are there within the art and design field where we believe um, the RCA should become much, much more um, research intensive? We had the Helen Hamlin Center. We also had Innovation RCA, which is our business incubator, commercialization center that, that generates extraordinary companies across all sorts of different sectors. Um, Jeremy, 
played quite a big hand in uh, setting that up. So I'm really talking to the audience rather than Jeremy here. But Innovation RCA has uh, an extraordinary track record um, of, uh, of, of, of starting new businesses. Um, so those are the two first sort of building blocks. And certainly when I um, joined the RCA, it, it struck me that one of the things that was missing was um, the underpinning of scientific rigor uh, that would make products um, and ideas realizable. Um, and so computer science seemed to me to be an obvious one. We had students who were creating extraordinary objects, um, concept designs that were purely speculative um, and how much better they would be if you could actually make them work and actually get them um, up onto the uh, innovation RCA floor. So computer science seemed an important one for me and we've just hired um, Dr. Ali Azadipour from Warwick University to, to lead that center. Material science also seems to be such a fundamental part of design, whether we're lightweighting a product, whether we're thinking about sustainability, landfill, uh, the whole sort of circular economy, that again seemed to be a very, very obvious one for, for the RCA to, 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 to um, embrace. Uh, and then with Sharon Borley, and, 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 and we've, we've established the Textiles Circularity Center that will sit next to the Helen Hamlin Center in the research um, building. Um, because again, you know, again, it's it, it, it's trying to get all of these um, areas to work synchronistically together, and, and finally, the one that actually I think might um, have tremendous bearing on the work of, of the Design Age Institute is the um, Intelligent Mobility Design Centre on the ground floor, um, because we know that people, um, older people, don't want to suddenly stop travelling. Uh, they don't want to necessarily always be st uh, stuck at home. They don't want to wait for the local bus service that is kind of getting worse and worse and worse. And the Intelligent um, Mobility Design Centre is really looking at the whole um, ecosystem of transport, transports in cities, public transport, private transport, um, and, and how we can actually address um, some of the challenges uh, around uh, around transportation, uh, and I'm sure that they will be designing an autonomous vehicle um, specifically for older people. Um, I have absolutely no doubt that that will come our way. Um, following on from the, uh, the from the NHS uh, ambulance um, that uh, that was worked on by the Helen Hamlin Centre and, uh, and and Dale Harrow from Intelligent Mobility and Rama in the past. So that's a really interesting uh, sketch of the context, um, which is very promising. I mean, when I co-founded the Helen Hammond Centre of Design with Roger Coleman in the late 90s, we were the only research centre of any yeah. scale yeah. in college. And we, it, 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 in one sense, it's good to be on your own. In another sense, it's not good to be on your own. And this idea of, of um, looking at, at, at healthy ageing uh, innovation alongside robotics, computer science, intelligent mobility, uh, smart textiles, I think is quite an exciting uh, tapestry of things, cutting edge design that the Institute will be able to dip in and out of these pools of expertise. I just wonder, Helen, does that, does that, um, does that uh, future sound exciting to you in terms of exploiting the latest digital technologies, for example. It's absolutely essential. I mean, again, this is something that I think has changed dramatically during this very sad and difficult period of COVID. But um, we must do it and also try and teach people like me how to use it because there is a terrific age gap in yeah. uh, the understanding of computerized um, everything. Agree. And unfortunately, people you know, who are older. Um, one little word of caution. Um, my mother had a motorised uh, little car in Oxford, uh, which is a very nice place to grow older in, and now has Professor Sarah Harper working on an intergenerational uh, new complex, which will obviously is being looked at and helped with by the Design Institute. But do limit the speed on these little cars because mummy drove far too fast. Uh. <laughs> well, that's absolutely a, a priceless option. Um, I, I would just like to kind of uh, 
conclude this session by asking both of you um, to describe your aspirations, not just for the G New Design Institute, but for the healthy aging agenda generally. What, what, what would, what would uh, you know, what would you like to see happen? Um, what would represent, uh, remember we've got this government grand challenge, what would represent success uh, for you? I'll start with you, Paul. Oh gosh, I, I think if we're looking at the kind of the attitudinal change, I think it's more a normalization. I mean, because uh, Helen said, you know, the walkers are the most degrading object you could give to anybody. Uh, and there are plenty of other ones as well that we, we can think of older people being given. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just normalize um, what we give older people and, and, and not have to make them either so deeply unattractive or so childish sometimes as well, because I think that can sometimes also be bad, is, 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 is when we kind of denigrate older people and we sort of belittle them by infantilizing them again into the sort of, you know, the Shakespeare's seven ages. Um, anything that kind of makes us a little bit more respectful, particularly, I think, in the Western Hemisphere towards older people. Finally, I just would say one thing. I think... And I remember you saying this to me, Jeremy, that when, when you opened the centre, the Helen Hamlin Centre, well, I think there was only one professor possibly in, in architecture who was really interested in the centre. Now, we know that room is packed every summer with students from textiles, uh, graphic design, architecture, interiors. They are swarming in. Um, and I think as long as we can keep that massive growing interest amongst our student body, there's real hope for the future that, that, that older people will get um, the attention and services and products that they deserve. Thank you. Yes, I think the normalization of aging, I think, is an important uh, aspect. Um, Lady Hamlin, the final word to you. What are your aspirations? Very, very simple, Jeremy, very simple. <laughs> 30 years ago, a lot of wonderful new designs were shown at the Boiler House uh, exhibition. I would like to see coming out of this new design age, much more sophisticated, put together with people concentrating their minds and their design and skills on, on identifying the problems and solving them. I'd like to see products on the market mm -hmm. because last time very few of the products that were designed ever appeared on the market but this time they really have to message to you Colm with my yeah. love <laughs> well I think that's an uh that's uh that's a really uh, uh um, an important challenge to cut through and really create from scratch because the longevity market as it's called um, doesn't really exist at the moment. We've got to not just uh, not just break into it, but we've got to uh, shape it. Um, uh, and of course, it is a milestone today. Thirty years uh, of Helen Hamlin Trust support for the Royal College of Art. Um, I'm going to make a shameless plug. New hey. book coming out this summer. <laughs> um, uh, it's published by Lund Humphreys. It's the story. Uh, of inclusive design. It's called Designing a World for Everyone, 30 Years of Inclusive Design, um, written by yours truly, um, uh, with lots of contributions from everybody around the Royal College of Art and the Helen Hamlin Trust. It's the story of inclusive design through 30 objects and environments, um, you know, A for ambulance, you know, W for, for wheelchair and, and so on. Um, uh, so do look out for it. Um, but it is a testament to unbroken uh, uh, and generous support of the Helen Hamlin Trust. Can I say a huge thank you to uh, the RCA's uh, uh, Vice Chancellor, Paul Thompson, and to Lady Hamlin uh, for joining us today. Um, I'm now going to hand over uh, to Rama Girawu, the director of the Helen Hamlin Centre for Design, who actually joined on the same day I did um, a long time ago. And Rama was the co-conspirator in writing the bid to win the money for the Institute yeah. Rama is going to steer things on from here. I'll be back to say a few words later. Um, thank you all very much. And a special thanks to Paul and to Helen. Over to Rama. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Helen. Um, and 
Um, may, may I add my own welcome to all of you around this extended Zoom room. Um, I'm told we had so many people sign up that we had to extend its capability. What you would have seen this morning reads very much like an origin story around design and aging. You know, um, Dr. Paul Thompson, um, who has really marinated the RCA research capability to be able to incubate not just one center on inclusive design, but an institute um, around aging. Um, Jeremy, who has been a tireless champion for inclusive design and even written the book on it, as you can see. And Jeremy really spearheaded um, this idea together with myself and Dr. Chris McGinley, who leads our aging research at the center. And of course, Helen, Helen, I always jokingly say you gave so many people in this world a career in inclusivity, and that continues today. Your vision and foresight brought together the words design and aging in the 80s when they were perhaps seen as an oxymoron. So what you've seen um, you know, today is really that origin story. We're going to now concern ourselves with what are we going to do? Um, and I think that's a really important part. So may I start off with a movie that will outline in three minutes um, what is this new Design Age Institute going to do and where do we position ourselves? So can we play the movie? No matter our age, one thing we all have in common is that we are all ageing. By 2040, a quarter of those of us living in the UK will be over the age of 60. Virtually 100% of us will be active online and those of us over 55 will account for 63 pence of every pound spent, while those over 50 will make up for 40% of total earnings. Our homes, neighbourhoods and workplaces will all need to do a better job of adapting to the significant demographic and technological changes ahead. With an empathetic and people-centred approach, design is a powerful tool for translating people's needs into tangible products and services, enabling all of us to work, socialise, live independently and experience joy throughout our lives. The Design Age Institute was established in 2020 in response to the UK government's grand challenge on an ageing society. The Design Age Institute combines skills and expertise from world-leading organisations in research, design, innovation and learning. Together, we aim to transform support for ageing communities through the development of original research, products and services that will support people to remain at work for longer and help everyone to enjoy five extra healthy independent years of life. Over the coming decades, the market for well-designed products and services for ageing consumers will only increase. Business and service providers now have a unique opportunity to tap into the enormous potential of the longevity economy by moving away from primarily focusing on illness and frailty and better responding to the needs, wants, interests, aspirations and demands of an ageing audience. Working collaboratively across industry, academia and the public sector, the Design Age Institute is perfectly placed to use design-led innovation to bridge the gap between people's needs as they age and the development of desirable and commercially viable products and services that increase demand and enable happier ageing. At the forefront of our strategy for delivering impact is research into the Healthy Ageing Marketplace and National Directory for Design and Healthy Ageing, Training and Skills Development for Business Leaders and Creatives, Pathfinder initiatives to bring an array of exciting new products and services towards market. Workshops, talks and exhibits to engage public audiences in the debate about the future of ageing. And an active community of healthy ageing advocates to promote and celebrate an age-inclusive society. These innovations will help make a real difference in the lives of every one of us as we age. Find out more by visiting designage.org. So there you have it. And in the chat has been posted some links to that movie, if you haven't um, had enough of that already. <laughs> um, so uh, just a little bit of an introduction as to 
um, you know, the Helen Hamlin Center and Design Age. Um, uh, as um, director of the Helen Hamlin Center, I think, you know, we have, we look at inclusive design along four innovation trajectories. There's age, there's ability, there's gender and their race. I feel that personally, I've had a 25 year love affair, or should I say column and design age um, institute, a joy affair with inclusive design. But the heartland was really started off as aging. Um, before I introduce Colm and ask him to, to take us through um, a presentation on age, agency and joy, I wanted to quote a designer's designer, um, Coco Chanel, who when speaking about age said this, you can be gorgeous at 30, charming at 40, and irresistible for the rest of your life. I feel that the Helen Hamlin Center has just turned 30, so maybe we're gorgeous, but we really hope that this event launches the Design Age Institute, Institute to be gorgeous, charming, and irresistible to all of you. And it's incredibly important because our numerical age, you know, we often fix age as a number, as that film showed, but it's only relevant to your passport, I feel. There's other ages, a biological, a consumer, a mental age, an energetic age, and a joyful age. So could I ask the new director of the new institute, Colm Lowe, um, to please come online. And um, whilst you're cranking up your presentation, a few words of introduction. Colm is a serial innovator in the public and private sector. Um, he was a very early convert to inclusive design, was one of our very first entries where he created um, a wonderful piece of design called the Limpet. Colm had the very easy job of being head of design at the NHS and brings all of those skills to the leadership and the guidance of this new Design Age Institute. And I just want to end with three words that Colm said to me about his vision for this institute, and that is impact through empathy. Colm, over to you. Thank you very much, Rama. Um, I was gonna give a brief introduction to myself, but I, I don't need to now, you've said more than I ever could. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I've been asked to give a, a brief chat on age, agency, and joy, and so I'm going to do that. But some of you will have noticed that the photograph on this first slide is of a slightly older version of myself, column low version 4.0. And I'll explain this photograph at the end of the presentation as a way to hopefully keep you on a hook until 15 minutes has gone up, gone by. A brief introduction to, to, the, to the new partnership funded by Research England. Uh, you've heard already that we have five partners, the Oxford Institute of Population Aging at Oxford University, the National Innovation Centre for Aging at Newcastle University, the International Longevity Centre, the Design Museum, and ourselves, the Helen Hanlon Centre for Design at the Royal College of Art. And as has been mentioned, we are being set up to become eventually the National Strategic Unit for Design and the Healthy Aging Economy. And in particular, to take on the UK government's grand challenge on aging, which is trying to target and create an, uh, people to enjoy an extra five healthy independent years of life, to narrow the gap of the experiences between the richest and poorest, to support people to remain at work for longer, to build consumer markets that better meet their needs, and to drive improvements across social care. So those are our main targets. And this is our team. Um, at the top is the RCA, and other than Jeremy Rahm and Chris, all of these people uh, on the top line of the RCA have been recruited uh, during lockdown, during the pandemic, um, interviewed and given the jobs over Zoom. So this is, this is my team, um, most of which I have no idea how tall they are, we haven't met. Um, hoping that situation will change in the next month or so. But this is us, this is the Design Age Institute. So one of the big things we have to look at is age. Um, what is age? And this is a, a big focus of research for us to really understand what age and aging means. And this is the best uh, diagram I've got on why this is a big issue today. 
Um, in the last 12,000 years, the global life expectancy has remained pretty consistent at between 20 and 30 years old. And then suddenly, 200 years ago, for a variety of reasons, it shot up. And people are now living to 70 and 80. And, and actually, there is no necessarily reason to believe that that line is going to change over time. We are going to see global life expectancy increase, we believe. And specifically in the UK, we're going to see a three-wave tsunami coming, partly the demographic shift. By 2040, a quarter of the UK population will be over 60. But this is mirrored by a financial time bubble that is also coming through. Um, so by 2040, over 55s will account for 63 pence in every pound spent. Over 50s already hold 70% of all the household wealth. So this will be a fairly um, well-off demographic shift um, that we haven't seen before in the UK. And again, this will be matched by technology proliferation. Research has told us in the past that 70% of the elderly are now online, rising to virtually 100% by 2030. But this research is old. By the time we get out of lockdown and this pandemic is over, we believe that nearly 100% of the elderly will be online through necessity. So these three things are going to create big societal changes. And we need to understand these in great detail to be able to better understand our marketplace and, and how to serve them. And when you talk about age and we talk about aging, the narrative seems to be predominantly about ability and frailty or declining ability. And yes, it is true. As we all age, our physical ability changes over time. You do not see many 80 year olds turning out playing international rugby for Ireland. Um, our abilities do change over time and we have to understand this. But so do our mental abilities change over time. Um, possibly because of dementia or some other cognitive um, problem. So we have to understand how these two things work together. But also other aspects change over time. Our social ability, our social frailty, our social resilience changes over time. As we become older, we maybe lose family members, parents certainly, maybe partners, maybe siblings, maybe even our children get their own families and move away. And we find that the social networks that we relied on in middle age start to decline and we become quite socially frail. And then lastly, economic frailty and economic ability. Again, as we age and we enter retirement perhaps and we stop working and we rely on a pension, we become economically um, more frail, lacking a bit of resilience, the inability to recover maybe from a big financial hit. Um, taking a mortgage out of 25 years when you're 80 is impossible, I think you'll find. So our economic situation can also change as we age. And it's these four leaves, this Hamlin clover leaf, as we're calling it, is the way we like to talk about aging. We don't like to talk about numbers. We'd rather talk about ability and life's transitions. And if you lose one of these leaves of your clover leaf, then you become at risk, becoming at risk of needing support. Uh, to help you live independently and with dignity. If you lose two of these leaves, then you are probably being supported and helped in your, in your daily activities. If you leave three or four, then you are more likely than not dependent um, on other people um, for sustenance. And so we're trying to understand these transitions and how these leaves impact people is quite important to us. But the truth is, we don't want to talk too much about declining ability. We're aware of it. It happens. It's inevitable. We all understand it. Being less able isn't important. I have no intention of playing rugby for Ireland when I'm 80. So ability is only important when you cross this line of transition, going from able to unable, and then it becomes important. But before that event takes place, being a little frail or a little less able is not important as long as you can live a happy life. What we'd rather, and, and the, sorry, the stats bear this out, 26% of people, only 26% of people over 65, say they have a difficulty, a severe difficulty, carrying out personal care or household activities, which means the rest, nearly three quarters of the population of people over 65, have no or only a moderate difficulty in carrying out personal care or household activities, which means they're perfectly able to live independent lives, not needing support. And that's what we want to focus on. We want to focus on other aspects of aging, more positive aspects of aging, like wisdom. As you age, you become wiser. That is not to say that um, 
all, all old people are wiser than old young people. It is also not to say that having reached the age of 65, suddenly you become enlightened and reach wisdom. That is not true. But it is to say that more likely than not, that the 55 year old Mike Tyson is a wiser man today than the 18 year old Mike Tyson was back, back in the day. All those knowledges and experiences you build up and the ability and, and the will to reflect on them and learn gives people some level of wisdom. And we'd like to focus on those experiences and that knowledge and their reflection um, in a way to help people age healthier. Another thing that we hear a lot is that as you age, people become less interested in things. And again, we find this to be untrue, we think, that yes, as you age, your interests change. I mean, the 54 year old me is less interested in quite how skinny my genes are, or certainly less interested than the 24 year old me might have been. But I have other interests. I'm more interested in politics, in the environment, the economy, my garden, my family, other things. So your interests don't decline over time. They just change with your surroundings and the things that you have built up. And we want to look at these things to try to help people um, live healthier, happier lives as they age. This is best put, we think, or I think, by an Oscar Wilde quote. Um, the tragedy of growing old is not that you are old, it is that you are young. And we believe this to be true. The amount of people that we have spoken to in this area um, who some might consider old absolutely do not consider themselves as old. And in fact, any research that we have on this would suggest that the definition of old is simply 15 years older than you are yourself. Um, and so there's very few people that actually will say, I am old. Um, because people still feel young, they still have ambitions, they still want to achieve things. And that leads us into the subject of agency. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to have an impact on that agenda? So these are the perceptions of old. You know, you type in old into a search engine, words like this come up, boring, cranky, frail, tired, senile, feeble. feeble. They're all predominantly negative. Uh, and the perceptions of old are important. It is hard to believe in my head that a television program like this can still exist in this day and age. You know, the word codger is a disrespectful way of referring to an old man. If you were to replace codger with a, with a disrespectful term for any other minority group with a protected characteristic, this program would have been taken off the air immediately. It wouldn't have got past the first line of review. But I'm wondering why it is okay uh, in the world of aging that we allowed this blatantly ageist language to take place. And it's important because older people are the victims of pervasive stereotyping. Um, the stereotyping suggests they've got reduced cognitive and physical performance in a way that's important. Their unwillingness to engage in social activities, inability to recover from disease, and there's many more pervasive stereotypes about old people and aging. And this is a problem because it affects how they are treated by others. It affects their health and ultimately it negatively impacts the length and quality of their life. And in a, in a smaller but just as important way, perhaps, that it affects how people shop and buy and the goods and services that are produced for people as they age. 82% of those aged over 55 say their favourite retail brand does not understand them and what they need. And it is true, research will tell us, American research, but it suggests that as we age, we do spend a little bit less. In our 60s, 2.5% every year less, and maybe when we get up to our 80s, 3%, 3.5% less every year. So we do spend, yes, less as we age, but there's some pretty straightforward reasons for this. You get to a certain age and you have one of everything. You know, I have a toaster and I have clothes and I have a sofa and a house and a car and all the things. I don't need to buy any more of those things. So of course, as we age, we start to spend less. But there might be another reason for this. So this is a question, which one of these two is true? We spend less as we age, so suppliers don't design for our needs, or suppliers don't design for our needs. So as we age, we spend less because there's just not stuff out there that we want. And I think obviously both have some element of truth in them, but our focus is on the second, is to try to talk to and work with suppliers and think about people as they age, creating joyful and desirable products and services for them, and then see if they buy them. I would like to think when I retire, these are the products and services, or the products that will be about, as I need a little bit of help to remain independent in my own home. Unfortunately, neither of these two products are on the market at the moment. 
If I want some help, this is what I have to contend with, as Lady Hammond suggested. Um, functionally great, they do the job they're supposed to do. However, they are stigmatizing. Um, and they're not things that most people want to be seen with or have in their home. And therefore, people buy them and adopt them long after they actually need them, putting them at risk because they are so undesirable. And so we're creating a community, community for aging activists called This Age Thing. Uh, and I'm not going to talk too much about it because George from our team is going to be introducing it later on. But I would encourage everybody who's here to sign up, take a look at it, sign up if you can. It would be great to have you as part of our community. So the last thing and my favourite word, uh, joy, because surely that's what it's all about. Surely we should be creating products and services and a life where you're able to experience joy. Using wisdom on our interests and not focusing too much on declining ability until it is an issue. How do we start creating joy and desire in, in the objects and services that we produce? Um, so two interests, this idea that we become less interested in stuff, not true. Nearly three quarters of Brits have tried new activities since turning 60. 53% revel in the freedom that the later years offer and the freedom of time that that gives them. And one in five say active hobbies help them feel younger. So we are, as we age and getting older, actually more interested in, in, in embracing newness and new things and doing new things. Um, so the myth around being disinterested is untrue. And wisdom, this ability to use your knowledge and experience to make good decisions and judgments. How can we bring interests and wisdom together to help people make decisions that keep them healthier and happier for longer? It's important. So we want to focus on the pursuit of happiness. How can we help people be happy? Because happy is important. Happiness is linked to lower heart rate and blood pressure. Happiness provides protection against stress, disease, and disability. It helps people cope with chronic pain. Those who are happiest tend to live significantly longer than those who aren't. And, and it's no coincidence that happy people tend to make other people happy. So we want to pursue happiness for, for, for older people and people as they age. And 50% of individuals aged over 60 are at risk of social isolation. And one third will experience some degree of loneliness in later life. Loneliness and social isolation are growing public health concerns and are now recognized by the NHS as such. A longitudinal study at Harvard, which is almost now 80 years in its review, has proved that embracing community helps us live longer and be happier. Loneliness kills. It's as powerful as smoking or alcoholism. The key to healthy aging, the report says, is relationships, relationships, relationships. So again, how can we combine into this, this world of joy, our interests, our, all our lifetime's worth of learnings and social cohesion and inclusion to help people remain happier for longer and have lives full of joy. So this is what our aim, this is the big aim we have at the Design Edge Institute, to help bring joy into people's lives by lessening the impacts of the inevitable consequences of aging and by helping others develop products and services that meet users' needs, wants, and most importantly, desires. I said I'd explain this photograph. Um, about six or seven years ago, I was director of customer experience at a dementia care company. It was an upmarket property development company. And when I joined, we had the mantra, um, we are designing dementia care villages that are good enough that would put our own mothers in them. Um, and that seemed great as a mantra, um, only it failed quite spectacularly. It turns out people are quite happy to put their mothers in all sorts of horrible places. And it wasn't working, so we had to change the mantra. And we changed the mantra to, we've got to design dementia care villages good enough that I would live there myself. And that changed everything. Suddenly, oh, hang on, I wouldn't drink in that pub and I wouldn't eat in that restaurant and I wouldn't swim in that swimming pool. And there's not enough storage in the apartment for me. And these were all questions. Suddenly it was personal. And it reminded me of the expression, uh, as Rama pointed out 29 years ago when I did a, a project with uh, the Helen Hammond Centre Design Age, of a statement that Roger Coleman made frequently, which is you're designing for your future selves. And this is important. If we are lucky enough, we will all grow to be old. So you are not designing for some strange other people. You are designing for yourself, your future self. And that's why reminding ourselves of who we are as we age 
um, is important to what we're doing. And that's it for me. Uh, thank you. I'd like to hand over now to, um, to, to George, who is going to give a short visualization on your future self. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And um, thank you, Colin. Um, so, yes. So um, this is my future self. This is me at, um, in 80, at 85. Um, so what I'd like you all to do now is I would like you all to close your eyes. Um, how God, how wonderful does that feel to be able to close our eyes in a world where we seem to be staring at screens day and night? So yes, take this opportunity to rest your eyes. I'm gonna take you on a journey to explore your future self. It's a journey of imagination and it will last around about 10 minutes. So to prepare, let us all take a few minutes to make sure we are all comfortable. Let us make sure that our feet are grounded on the floor, that our arms and hands are relaxed, that our face is relaxed. We can even allow ourselves to have a gentle smile on our faces. Let's all be conscious of our breath, to be aware of the in-breath and the out-breath. To be aware of the full life cycle of your breath. Beware of the start, the air flowing in, the midpoint and the slight pause when the in-breath turns to an out-breath. And aware of the point when the out-breath ends before a pause to the next breath life cycle. So let's embark together on our journey to explore our future self. You are now aging. I want you to start thinking of yourself five years from now, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years even. And for some of you here today, 40, 50, 60, or even 70 years from now. Imagine yourself in the chair you are currently sitting in. You cannot move. You look down and see old hands, wrinkled. They seem as if they are separated from you. You look around your room. There is no one. You feel isolated. You feel alone. You lower your head and fear the future. The days are long. The past is your only comfort and you fear losing these memories. Does this image of your future self make you feel claustrophobic? Does it make you feel fearful? Does it make you want to turn away from this future version of you? This version of getting older is one that so many people fear and the reason that we are so scared of getting older. These images fuel our fear of our future self. They are soaked in stereotypes and are inherently deeply ageist to every version of our future selves today. But the good news is, and it is good news, that getting older will be very different for so many of us. There is a different future which is waiting for our future selves. The hundred year life is within our reach. This means we have more future ahead, more years of healthy living, healthy years in the middle of our lives. So what are you going to do with your extra years? Are you going to embrace lifelong learning so you can explore several careers in your life? Are you going to take that gap year in your 60s that you never did in your 20s and then come back and start a new business based on that idea you have always wanted to grow? Are you going to train to run that marathon that was always on your to-do list, inspired by more and more people in their 80s and 90s 
showing that it can be done. Are you going to think about your lifestyle to allow you to enjoy this longer life? Are you going to rethink how and where you live so you can live the way you want until the end of your life? This is the age of a longer future. And with this longer life, we need to break our attachment to ideas which hold us back as we... The three stages of life are full-time education, followed by full-time work, followed by full-time retirement no longer exists. This is the age of a longer future. This is the age of a multi-stage life, of lifelong learning, of looking what we can do to help ourselves to enjoy our longer lives of changing our mindset from one of decline to one of optimism and joy, because this joy will help us live not only longer, but healthier. So let's all take a moment to feel this joy in our future selves. I want you all to ask your future self, what is bringing you this joy? Is it an object? Is it a place? Is it people or a person? Is it an attitude? Let's all pause for a moment to feel what our future joy is. How does it look? How does it make you feel? And when you are ready, you can now slowly open your eyes and you will see that in the chat, the chat room, there is a form. So what we would like you to do is share that object, the place, the person or attitude of joy, which your future self has shared with you. So we'll give you a few minutes to do that. I'm just going to have a look to see what, what's coming through. Okay. Thrilled. Oh, some wonderful words coming through. Balanced, young, independent, invigorated, active, ambitious, determined, creative, excited, loved, purpose. Oh, truly wonderful. So keep, keep, those, keep those coming through. And while you do, I'm just going to just end um, with this inspirational quote from a Japanese Buddhist leader um, called Daisaku Okada. He was told in his 30s that he wouldn't live beyond that. He is now in his 90s, and I want to share his words with you. He says, there is a saying that goes, to a fool, old age is a bitter wind. To a sage, it is a golden time. Everything depends upon your attitude, how you approach life. Do you look at old age as a period of decline ending in death or a period in which one has the opportunity to attain one's goals and bring one's life to a rewarding and satisfying completion? Is old age a descending path leading to oblivion or an ascending path taking one to new heights? The same period of old age especially in terms of the richness and fulfillment you experience during these years will be dramatically different depending upon your own outlook. So it is the time to be joyful and embrace your future self. And thank you for going on the journey of imagination with me. Thank you.
Thank you so much, George. Um, a beautiful exercise. And I feel like I'm having to bring myself back from my 80 year old self. Um, what I wrote in the chat is the thing that brought me joy was my unchanging sense of self. And that brings a sense of joy. So um, there is a there is a truth there of um, you know, remembering ourselves through the life stages. And I think sometimes we talk at the center and at the RCA about life stage rather than age, because, um, you know, the definitions of age, as you see, as, as you've heard from the participants, have this beautiful emotional quality to them. So we are now going to um, um, step into a panel discussion with our representatives of our partners, um, our wonderful partners that Dr. Paul Thompson um, would have introduced. Um, I will give a brief introduction to each of them, then I'll ask them to uh, individually speak about their organization and their role in the DAI. And then we will take questions. Um, if you could please use the chat function, the sorry, the Q&A function, not the chat function, uh, to ask questions. I can see them rolling in and there's some um, beautiful discussions going on already. So please keep those questions coming in and I will pick up on them. We have um, alongside Colm and myself, we have four people joining this panel discussion. Um, there's Professor Sarah Harper, who is director of the Oxford Institute of Population Aging. Sarah is one of the leading academics um, uh, in the UK. You know, I cannot turn on the radio without hearing some wisdom and some new research from Sarah um, 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 being broadcasted. And Sarah, you know, um, I first read one of your papers that talked about the importance of grandparents and grandchildren um, over 10 years ago. And it, was a, is a, it, it, it formed a radical shift in my mind. Um, and I know that you bring research intelligence to governments, business and educators globally. So Sarah, if you can give us a wave and um, uh, tell us a little bit about um, uh, the Oxford Population, it's Oxford Institute of Population Aging and your role at the DAI. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I'm the Professor of Gerontology at the University of Oxford, the first Professor of Gerontology. So that was a really big step for Oxford and I'm PI on the Oxford Partnership. Um, and the Oxford team is responsible for scoping the research and policy context to the changing needs uh, and desires uh, of older adults. Uh, and as Lady Hamlin mentioned, we're also working with intergenerational communities. Thank you, Sarah. And if you notice, I'm trying to um, reach back to the memories of pre-2020, and we actually met, met physically and bring some of those individual connections that I've made with each of you into this call. So our next panelist is Tim Marlowe, Chief Executive of the Design Museum, which has become a benchmark for many other museums. Um, and Tim, I remember um, meeting you at the new old exhibition that you, you, you hosted, curated by Jeremy Myerson. We were expecting 20,000 people to come and see the, the exhibits on, on design for aging. And I think a, a princely number of 80,000 turned up, showing the real and radical interest that people have. Tim, I know you're a writer, a broadcaster, an art historian with a career that includes the Royal Academy and the White Cube Gallery. Can you please tell us a little bit about your work and what the Design Museum um, will bring to this partnership? Of course, thank you for, for inviting me and us. Um, I like Paul's phrase that the Design Museum is the disseminating centre. It sounds like a sort of agricultural thing where species are born, but it, I think that's part of what we are. We're also the shop front, I mean, or the door or the window uh, of Design Age Institute. And um, we are the only national design museum, we're the, we're the only design museum in England and Wales, but our remit is about design and design processes. And I'm keen to build on the idea that we're a hub, we're a laboratory, we're a showcase. We've got great 
spaces. We've got a great building uh, down in the Commonwealth Institute, just, just down the road from the Royal College, but we're national and international, and I want to animate that space, literally, metaphorically. Um, this isn't a puff for our programme, but i just give you an example that when we reopen on the 18th of May, uh, we'll have two exhibitions opening within a month. The first is uh, sneakers, a survey of sneakers, which are the most popular shoe across all age groups, and that notion of integra integrated design is quite interesting with sneakers, because that really, although the product fetishised youth initially it is something that now transcends age and, 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 and there may be some lessons to be learned from the, from the design approaches to, to that. And the other thing is that we're opening a Charlotte Perrion exhibition and Paul Thompson told me a wonderful story um, that when he was director of the Design Museum back in 1996, Charlotte Perrion came as a 93 year old to that exhibition. They did an exhibition back then. She wore pink sneakers. She helped install the exhibition at 93 and she lived a productive life, a sort of global change in design life till she was 90. So there's a celebration of, of, of a full life and an and ageing genius there. Um, our role with Design Age Institute, we're going to do two dedicated, of, uh, dedicated displays of research uh, in the spring of 22 and the spring of 23. This will be generated by Design Age Institute and we want to tour that nationally. And we're starting our learning programme. There's an executive education programme. We're looking at community programmes. We're looking at uh, perhaps a community garden. And we're going to um, kick off the public programme this summer around designing for your future self. So that's garbled but that's where we are there's lots to do and we're very excited to be doing it thank you tim it sounds like you will be busy <laughs> oh yeah um david sinclair um a good friend of the rca the helen hamlin center um and director of the international longevity center um which has a number of uh, an international reach David has a lifelong dedication to aging. He was head of policy at Help the Aged and chair of Open Age. And pre-lockdown, I remember, David, the last time we met was when you were curating conversations on policy and aging across Scandinavian governments. And this was at the Norwegian ambassador's residence. So that's the immortal image, image of us meeting physically that I have um, emblazed on my brain um, as we as we have moved into the Zoom rooms. So, David, can you tell us a little bit about um, the ILC and your role? Thanks, Rama. And I, one of the things I often say is when I started working in aging, I, a lot of the older people I work with that help the aged say to me, um, "You're too young to work in aging. It doesn't really happen anymore." And of course, at that point, I didn't have blue hair. So, you know, I've been around this space a long time. I also see a specialist think tank on longevity and its impact on society and have worked on sort of design issues. Um, um, as Helen said earlier, that's so, so important um, for, for about 20 years. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you, David. And um, the final panelist joining us um, is Professor Lynn Corner, who's co-founder and director of Voice, um, a network that um, 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 includes a lot of older people. And she's COO at the UK National Innovation Centre for Aging um, in Newcastle. Um, Lynn has a deep interest in aging and experience in dementia through the Dementia Innovation Hub at Newcastle. And I think Lynn, the last time we met physically, was when you were catching a flight back to London in Singapore. And we had a very exciting and early breakfast talking about the voice network. And in it was a sort of evil plan that was hatched to um, um, bring you into this Design Age Institute. So Lynn, can you please speak about um, uh, your role in this endeavor? Thank you, Rama. Yes, that just feels like yesterday, but it was some time ago. Um, hello, everybody. Um, it's an pl absolute pleasure to be here. So I'm Lynn. I'm the director of Voice, um, and it's uh, Voice is embedded in the UK's National Innovation Centre for Aging. Um, Voice really does do so well with um, the Design Age Institute because it is an international organisation. It's cross generational. It's a community of people who come together with a shared purpose of sharing insights, wisdom, stories from both their lived experience and their professional experience to really help businesses design and, and get on the market um, and into people's homes and lives, the products and services that we all aspire and desire to have. Um, so in many respects, voice is our voice, it's your voice. Um, you, you know, your current and future selves really resonates in terms of who are the current and the future kind of consumers. 
Um, you know, and I think there's a quote, isn't there, um, that every des great design begins with an even better story. And effectively, that's what we do. We're collecting evidence and we're collecting stories that we can then inform where the gaps are, where the unmet needs are. And as you said, you know, Voice is embedded in the UK's National Innovation Centre for Ageing, um, a national hub for ageing intelligence for businesses and brands addressing longevity economies. And we are just so pleased to have the Design Age Institute as our design partner and looking really you know, forward to closely collaborating and, and working closely together as we build our community. And, you know, as, as we've said several times today, it's about bringing, um, you know, those um, products and services to market. Uh, we've got two designers in residence, which we're delighted about, looking at pedestrianism with robots, as well as kind of financial models. And um, we are, you know, really, really looking forward to starting this programme of work and uh, continuing the journey from Singapore onwards, Rama. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And so excited that we have those designers in residence. Um, you know, they were final hires and they're, they're, they're finally in place. Yeah. So could I welcome Colin back to the panel? Um, and we will get started. Um, I wanted to start off by just asking you individually or in pairs a couple of quick fire questions and then we'll roll into something that feels a little bit more like a conversation. So I wanted to start with a question on the global perspective on policy and aging. Why is it important for us to take a global approach? And if I could direct that to Sarah and to David um, in the first instance. So um, Sarah, it looks like you're unmuted. Can I ask you to step in? Yes, of course. Um, no, I think that's a, a, an absolutely essential question. And, and in a way, it goes back to that history that Lady Hamlin was talking about. 30 years ago, uh, many countries were not recognizing that they were aging. Now there is barely a country in the world that doesn't recognize it's going to have an aging population. Uh, and I, th I think it's really important on two ways. One, there are so many examples of best practice in different countries uh, and actually worst practice. And therefore, I think it's essential that researchers and practitioners and policymakers really look at what is happening elsewhere. And, and the collection of case studies and people's voices is very important. But I also think it's important that we look at, particularly when we're looking at vulnerable older adults, that we look at international movements. Um, and here, you, the UN, WHO, Help Age International have been amazing in really raising the standard of issues around vulnerable older people. Um, and, and we've learned so much by looking at old age culturally. We, we know that aging is not fixed. We know it's malleable. We know it's culturally constrained. Uh, and I think if we can take an international perspective, uh, and I you know, will pass on here to the wonderful word that David's community of ILCs do, um, be, because we, we very much work at the macro level with data, we talk to international policymakers, we do a lot of work with the EU, but David is really working with people on the ground. Thanks, Sarah, and let me just jump in. I think, I think what's key, what I think is really key is that, to emphasize that the market is global, it's not just in the UK. In 2015, older households spent um, uh, across the G20 spent some almost 10 trillion um, US dollars, which is the equivalent of the GDP of Japan, Australia, Canada and Brazil. So older households are spending a huge amount of money. And actually, I think why it's really important as well is, frankly, the UK is falling behind. Just um, two months ago, the UK decided to dump its industrial policy. It's not clear what's going on with the grand challenges on ageing. And the day after the government dumped its industrial policy, I was approached by the French government to ask how they can promote um, the older, you know, businesses interested to French businesses interested in older consumers. So I think we've got to make the most of this opportunity of the design agency. And at the moment, there's a very real risk that we're, we're going to fall behind. Thank you both. Um, a, a bit of a technical um, request. Um, there's a little bit of feedback coming through the loop. So if I could ask panelists to um, um, mute yourselves when you're not speaking, this isn't me being draconian. Um, it's a request from our technician. I think really interesting um, there that, you know, speaking not just about good practice, but bad practice and speaking about the, the financial and the economic value that um, policy approaches, international policy approaches can bring. It really leads to a question around design. You know, 
the structural barriers that we've seen in the past to design-led innovation. You know, is design a dirty word? Um, why hasn't it been seen at the forefront? And I'm going to throw that one to Colm and Tim. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's, it's, for me, one of the biggest barriers is attitudinal, which I don't think is the attitudes towards um, aging haven't changed significantly in the last 40 or 50 years and or at least have, haven't kept up with the change in demographics. Um, you know, so I think this is that attitude that it is not an attractive market. Uh, there's no money in it. Um, it's too hard to reach. It's difficult. Um, you know, so the, the private sector organisations who are about profit um, and, and rightly about profit, not, I'm not knocking that, see this as unattractive, where, where the fact is that that has changed. And therefore, people's attitudes have to change to match it. And I think until we really um, you know, get active about ageing and ageism, then that isn't going to change. Uh, and and you know, I think we have a right to be a little bit shouty about that, that agenda at, at the Institute, that you know, these things, these attitudes towards ageing and, and it being an attractive marketplace must change. But we must prove it through better designed goods and services that actually appeal to those customers. So you, I, I, you, um, you, you do that you do that shouty thing in such a, an unsargal out way there, Colin. When you say we've got a right to be shouty, but you do it so it's such it's kind of balanced. <laughs> Thank um, you. I just wanted so to the, the language is important here, isn't it? You you know you you asked about the, um, the, the barriers to it all, and that actually um, you know, I don't know whether we have necessarily the, the right kind of like I mean that the, the lodgers for codgers thing that you showed me I hadn't seen that before, but the but the idea that we aging is something we all feel deeply personal about we have a personal ownership of but at the same time there are kind of universal narratives and structures around that and that's the tension and that's the interest i think and, and it also plays to the point you were making others were making earlier about globalization that everything gets polarized that institutions need to be hyper localized in the way that they engage but that doesn't mean they can't have universal resonance and shouldn't have universal resonance and i think it's the same with the issue of aging that there are local issues and solutions but actually it's a global network that needs to be harnessed and there are global attitudes that need to be harnessed and in the way we talk about this um uh, in some ways we, we we don't we're not equipped yet i think i mean i don't mean you the illustrious panel who are thinking about this all the time but i think societally we're not equipped in the in the in, in, in the way we, we we discuss these issues. Integration's clearly the way, isn't it? And part of integration, Tim, I think, is the creation of a future-proofing market. And Lynn, you know, you are very close to the voice um, of the user, the voice of older people. Um, see what I did there? <laughs> and um, just wondered if you can come in and how do we? create a future proofing market what's missing from the mouths of you know what, what do you hear from the mouths the hearts the minds of the older people you speak to i think it's um we've touched on it once already today that you know when you think about aging it isn't about oldness it's actually about through life health and well-being so we are as interested in a six-year-old as we are with a 106 year old and we have to learn from past mistakes. I mean, Sarah and I, both demographers, you know, we know a lot of these issues. We know what they are and we need to plan for them. So actually, um, actually being able to kind of look at the evidence that we have, take evidence based approaches and plan ahead, I think, is what we're going to need to do so that we're not just um, designing for current older people, but we're thinking about what the future will be. But then again, you know, um, part of the, the joy of working with Design Age Institute and we can bring Nika and Voice and, and the other partners together is that it is also about, um, you know, having that cross generational dialogue and conversation about how we can harness wisdom and experience and learn from what works and then really kind of use our imagination and, you know, match what's needed with what's possible and embrace the technology, embrace, you know, new, new AI, machine learning so that we can really have kind of aspiration about the future. Um, and I think that's gonna be absolutely key that we consider not just oldness, but you know, through life, health and well-being. And I don't think we'll go far wrong. Thank you, Lynn. And you, you mentioned, we know the issues. So can I bring David and then Sarah in to tell us what are, what are the issues? What are the top th two or three issues? Thanks so much, Rama. And I, let me be a bit glass half full, which is really unlike me. I'll be a bit joyful and positive for a change. 
Let's not forget there were some brilliant designers on the line here. There has been over the last 30 years, people like Jeremy and Rama and the team, we've seen huge innovation. You know, we, over recent years, we've got the Gillette Razor for carers. Google have redesigned their homepage. Amazon have redesigned their packaging. Good Grips was 40 years ago. Saga was 65 years ago. Let's not pretend industry hasn't moved. E-bikes today are going to transform our built environment over the next decade. Actually, the, the sales of e-bikes are being driven by older people. We, the, it's going to change where we live. It's going to change how we live. So let's not be too negative about the lack of change. Three, three, three points. So one, ageism, I would say, and I don't think this is amongst designers. Let me be really positive about designers. I think it's about me and you pretending we don't age. It's pretending that we're not like our dads. It's pretending that our eyesight doesn't go and our hearing goes. It doesn't go. It absolutely does. And until we stop pretending we age, we're not going to tackle that. Secondly, I think, and some, someone mentioned this on Twitter, we're still too focused on function over design. There's a really, really solid market for disability equipment. Some of it's a bit ugly, but frankly, it works and it's reliable. So we're, we're really focused on the reliability, not the, not the design, not the, the, the aesthetics of the design, sorry. Uh, and then finally, I'd say actually, you know, whilst, you know, I would absolutely big up the market in this space. Um, you know, if you look at the market around disability equipment, and I think, you know, we, all, we know we need a little bit of help as we age, but actually the English Longitudinal Study of Aging shows that for most of us, the challenges around, um, you know, ability to make telephone calls, ability to do shopping, ability to do banking, doesn't happen until our 80s and 90s. And actually, frankly, the market there is relatively small. So I think we've got to be really careful about that. But, you know, basically, core to me is we've got to all stop pretending we don't age ourselves. Powerful message there, David. And um, Sarah, what are the issues from your perspective? And, uh, I'll Sorry, just I, just, I, I just couldn't unmute for some reason. Um, well, well, actually, in many ways, I just want to build um, on two things, that, the things that Lynn said, and also that um, fantastic um, A film we saw, and also the presentation from Colin, because a lot of it, I think, is shifting away from this idea of age uh, and into transitions, and it's transitions across the life course, and we have transitions across the entire life course, and they don't stop just because we tend to reach a certain chronological age. Uh, we know that uh, across our life courses, it's inequalities, uh, health, education, which define whether we're successful or not. And we know as we get older, that tends to come together. Um, so transitions are particularly important at the end of our lives. And I think if we can get away from age and focus on transitions in later life, uh, and look at design which supports us through those transitions, facilitates us through those transitions, um, both across our lives and into uh, old age. Um, I think that is a really, really important focus. And I think the other really important thing is that to a certain extent, at certain times of our life, we're dependent. We're dependent when we're children. We're dependent, sadly, if we become disabled or frail. Uh, we also are dependent in the very, very far last years of our life. Uh, and to a certain extent, if we can push back this idea that old age starts at a particular age and turn it instead that we're all active contributory adults until we can't be anymore. And for many people, that is really towards the end of our lives. And then we can sort of focus on dependency. But the rest of the time, we're focusing on these transitions across the life course. And the other really important thing, and again, it's been said, um, is inequalities. We must make design which is accessible to all. We have to make sure that the market isn't telling us what we want. And I think that was a really important point that Colin brought up. Um, and that's why one of the really exciting things for us at Oxford is, is really to use, for example, David talked about the ELSA, the English Longitudinal Study. Uh, there is the um, Open Society. There is um, huge uh, international data sets, as well as a lot of very good empirical research, really to understand what are the real needs of older adults not needs and desires that are given to them by the market. So they're my three, I think, the life course, inequalities, and making sure we really are focusing on needs and desires. And Sarah, if I may pull a fourth from what you said, which was the word language. Um, yes. And this is, a, this is a question for the panel sort of opening up. Is the language wrong? Do we need to reframe, rethink language? And when I think of the words that George was reading out, um, as a result of her 
um, you know, her, her experience. And they weren't, they were very different from the slide that Colm showed when he Googled age. What do we do about language? Well, one thing we have to say is we have come a long way. So at the end of the 90s, um, I was involved in writing a book and we wanted to talk about critical perspectives on later life. And the pushback we got, you can't talk about later life, it's old age. But now everyone talks about later life. Um, occasionally you hear people talk about the elderly, but if you listen to the radio, you listen to public discourse, you listen to public policy, we've moved away from that. We now increasingly talk about older adults. And in fact, not only people like um, Age UK and Help Age International and, and the other NGO communities, academic journals, many media outlets insist that you talk about older adults. So I think we have come a long, long way. There's still a long way to go, but you know, we really have moved the agenda quite a lot, I think. Thank you. And who else wants to come in? Lynn? Yeah, I, mean, I would totally agree with, with Sarah there. And I think as well, you know, um, we, we don't talk about older people as if they're a homogenous group. Of course they're not. You know, I mean, we don't talk about kind of the over 50s as if they're kind of one um, group. This is just the most incredible, diverse, um, you know, spectrum of experiences, different uh, knowledge and so on and so forth. And so actually consumers themselves are going to drive that difference because they're not going to put up with ageist assumptions and they're going to be increasingly challenged as people actually start to kind of demand products and services, which is why this uh, partnership is just so timely. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, we had a voice workshop and uh, we had this man incandescent that there weren't products in the shops that he wanted to buy so that he could plan his future kind of 10 years. And he was 96. So, you know, to me, there's this kind of real um, challenge coming forward. And um, so I think, you know, we, we must be kind of cogent of the, the challenges. They're still there. There's a lot to do. Um, but I think we have got room for kind of cautious optimism that actually um, we have made um, huge progress and will continue to do so. So Colm, then Tim. Where are we going to take this? <laughs> yeah, well, I, th I think, you know, when we when I first joined uh, the Design Age um, Institute, we started talking about, OK, what language do we use? What's the right term? You know, is it older people, people as the age, aging people, aging humans, old, elderly, seniors, as I think we use in America? And I think the truth is we as a panel can't sit here and tell you. We have to ask our audience, how do you want to be referred to? And, we need, and I think that's a big piece of work that we haven't really got on our radar yet, but we've got to engage with people and understand what is the right language to refer to people. Because you have to call it something, otherwise you end up either saying terms that can be insulting to some, or you end up just talking numbers. And, and numbers, you know, in, in the research, I've got over 50s, over 55s, over 60s, over 65s, because somebody decided to draw the line at that age and say, right, over 55s represent. So I think we need to do, you know, as, as an institute, that little bit of work. Um, and I don't think anybody's doing it because, again, because of ageism, it's not seen as an issue. So nobody's been doing that work. And, and I think we have a great opportunity to take a lead in that. And I think we should. And, and the second point, very quickly, um, from an earlier point about not designing disability equipment, you know, we're looking to work with a high street sports brand to look at sports equipment, you know, to, to encourage healthy aging and to people continue to exercise as they get older. And, and we had to convince them that, you know, this isn't about creating products for people with reduced mobility. And therefore, if you happen to be either frail or weak or have some sort of shoulder injury, this is the products for you. If you do this well, this is design, better design for everybody. It's back to the term inclusive design that the Royal College of Art coined 30 years ago, um, Roger Coleman. It's about designing. If you design products that are that are good for people at the extremes, they're better for everybody. Um, and that's we've got to get back to that to some degree, inclusively designed products that, that anybody can buy and, and are happy to buy. Tim? Which place to my point about sneakers? Is actually, which is that you can get the most bespoke speakers at any point in your uh, life, uh, professional, active, sportswear, fashion or whatever. But at the same time, there's a universalism about that design that doesn't fetishize a particular age group. Anyone can wear them and does. And I think there's a broader point, actually, that stems from what you're saying, Colin, um, which is about... Um, it's about a broader approach to design. I mean, we know that public buildings should take more responsibility in this regard, but often solutions for disability like ageing are these horrible things that are sort of stuck on in a kind of, I mean, they're expensive, but they look cheap. They're not fit for purpose. And they, and at the same time, they, they, they discriminate in the most horrible way. 
But if we had a more integrated approach to design, I would call actually domestically. I think that I think that when houses, prototypes for houses, you know, I've been I've been talking to a number of designers who've been looking at different prototypes for houses that can be built in different parts of the world for people who at the moment find it difficult to afford accommodation. The notion that you can integrate into that kind of domestic uh, prototyping um, a whole range of design solutions that actually would help an aging population, but also help an active population, help a young population, here he says, falling into the traps of different linguistic categories. But you see where I'm going. It, that integrated approach should should just be should be essentially the way that designers think and are commissioned and are empowered to think rather than it simply being which group or which which area do we need to focus on. Good design should should actually be potentially be able to deal deal with with it for everyone. So I think there is a linguistic blueprint of openness from those answers that we can learn from. They, you know, I believe that every word carries a seed of change and we need to use our words carefully. We should treasure and measure them because um, they can instigate. And there's one word that you've all used, which I just want to focus on, and that's ageism. You know, if we take um, the other isms that are rising, you know, if we look at age, ability, gender, and race, just to take four, racism, genderism, ableism, um, are absolutely not acceptable. And if you take racism, race, racial epithets that were sort of casually thrown out in a Tarantino movie are just not acceptable, um, either externally or internally. What do we, what, what, what's the landscape around ageism? Um, and, um, you know, the, the great uh, designer, Pat Patricia Moore, who I believe may be on this call, um, very famously did an experiment in the 1980s where she dressed up as um, around 12 different types of older person and traveled America. And she wrote a book called Disguise, which was almost, it was this, this design ethnographic experience of the, 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 the rise in ageism, that it was, it was a litmus test of how ageist a society can be. Um, so what, how, are we activists in ageism? Are we designers? Are we policymakers? We're all humans, but how do we start to address this issue of ageism? So who wants to come in on that? Lynn, I can see you reaching. <laughs> Sarah's got a hand up too. <laughs> Lynn then Sarah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we have all covered it. And I think it's because, um, you know, it is something that just is the elephant in the room a lot of the time. And it's something that we just need to tackle. Um, I, I, I do think, though, that um, it's, um, you know, prevalent in all sorts of culture. If you look, for example, Voice did a piece of work on greeting cards recently. And again, you know, what the humour in those greeting cards came from an image of older people as, um, you know, um, you know, forgetting, being forgetful and, and so on and so forth. And so it needs to change. But increasingly, we do have fantastic role models. And again, I do think that um, actually the role models that we have for kind of um, celebrating, um, you know, through life wisdom, uh, knowledge, experience, and kind of putting that focus on kind of the, 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 the human capital that we accumulate as, as we grow older, I think we are starting to, to see that change. Uh, but that it's not something that we can be complacent on. And I, I do think that it is one of the biggest challenges that we face. And actually the role that design can have because of it, it's in the, the designer's DNA almost to unpick some of that ageism. I think that's just such an opportunity for the Design Age Institute to almost have that challenge inherent to make sure that we are kind of designing for and celebrating um, longer lives um, and, and putting ageism in, in its place. Thank you, Sarah. I mean, I think um, we have learned a lot through COVID. And I think without any doubt, um, everyone is now recognizing that we live in institutionalized ageist societies. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at the outpouring that there was about the way that older people were treated during COVID, um, there is barely a professional society did, that did not call it institutionalized ageism. And I wrote a a piece that I've never had so much reaction on Twitter. I'm not great on Twitter, but it, this really hit a chord. And it was, it was about whether um, the way older people were treated during COVID was pragmatic policymaking or was it institutionalized aging? And one of the things I did was use a vignette. I'll just very, very quickly share it with you. 
Um, at the beginning of, of the epidemic or pandemic, we were very worried about pregnant women. We didn't know how vulnerable they were. And there's three questions. Would we have said to every pregnant woman throughout your entire pregnancy, stay at home, do not go out, be completely isolated? If there had been peaks on maternity wards of deaths among pregnant women and babies, would it have taken weeks and weeks and weeks for us to try and work out what was happening? And really crucially, would we have put interventions into pregnant women uh, without their consent or even knowledge? Because that's exactly what we did to older people, not just here, but in fact, across the world. We shielded them, we allowed them to die in care homes, we know how, and more importantly, we had do not resuscitate orders. Um, and I have really changed actually since COVID. And I think there is this growing feeling that we really live in an institutionalized age of society. And I think Colm has said it all many times, that's something we really have to tackle. Okay. Colm, let's just come in, come in there, Rama, just sort yeah. of, so yeah. Jump I, in then, Colm. Com completely, com I, I completely agree with Sarah. And I think the, of course, Bob Butler, who founded the ILCs, coined the phrase ageism back in, in the 1960s. Um, I think we tackle, I think one thing we have to do is we tackle ageism by being age neutral. And actually just to sort of challenge one of the points from earlier, I don't think, we should have an autonomous vehicle designed for older people. I think we should have an autonomous vehicle which is designed perhaps using the same principles that Ford used when they designed the Ford Focus. I think it would be a backward step for us to have products and services designed specifically for, for older people. Um, and, and I think the thing is we've got to look to ourselves as advocates. As someone who's campaigned on age, ageism for a long time, we, we say, you know, we don't want ageism, but then we say we do want special treatment as we age. And I think we've got you know we've really got to challenge that actually we have a right to learn but as um Lynn just said we also have a responsibility to decumulate that knowledge and and actually we're far too often ageist in that we say you know to younger people well to participate in society you've got to learn to use the internet to older people we say don't worry dearie you're 85 you haven't got to bother anymore and frankly we've got to tackle that and the only way we tackle that is by really fundamentally saying look you have a right to learning and the responsibility to use that learning. Colin. Yeah, you know, again, this is where I think we're allowed to be a little bit shouty. Uh, and I know George Lee is going to talk a little bit about our um, ageing activists, this age thing uh, later on. But I think, you know, the, the way I think about it, and it's quite a controversial thing to say, I, I appreciate that, but older people are seen as youth culture's sort of waste product. You know, you, you, you're out of that production consumption model and therefore, right, we don't know what to do with you. Um, and I think that's really dangerous. And as somebody who's getting closer to it, really worrying, um, you know, and, and I think we're allowed to sort of look at both aspects of that equation and, and have an, and we must have an attitude about it and we must promote that agenda because that is at the heart of a lot of things. These, these negative, um, incorrect assumptions about people as the age. And I think, Tim, was that a hand that I saw? It was, sorry, it was. I, I, the spirit with which this discussion is conducted is exemplary and, and, and absolutely right. But I think the notion of age being age, age neutral is really powerful from David because, uh, yeah, you can be shouty, Colin, and you, as I said before, you do it elegantly, but it's like the culture wars. It's really, it's really unproductive to get involved in those debates if we're not careful. I mean, you know, we've just had a very eloquent explanation of, of what went wrong in COVID, and we know that. But it's actually an integrated approach that society must take. There is a generation of school children who are now going to be one, two years behind. And it's not an either or, but it is if you get too shouty about ageism. It, it, so it's a toned, responsible approach. And the one thing that maturity brings, and, and I'm not being ageist in this, but is, it should be the capacity to see the bigger picture and be generous spirited. So I would tone down the shouty and I would look for a more integrated approach. But if the director of the Design Age Institute can't get up and shout, uh, what's the world coming to? So we'll give you an exemption on that. But I do think the tone across the board in the debates and the discussions and in the exhibitions and displays that we're all going to do, I think we need to be generous and inclusive. So Colm, yourself and George may have just been given a pass to be a little bit shouty in a, in a kind well, of land, landscape of conversation. Well, that's why, um, that's, why I've, that's why I've brought in George, so that I can, <laughs> can take a back seat and uh, the world can be protected from my, from my uh, shoutiness. Um, so yes. So there's been a lot of questions bubbling up through on the 
on the chat and I want to take as many of them as possible. I have lots of questions I can ask, but I don't want to um, um, hog the stage. Um, there's a question here from Sarah Mullen, who says, what lessons can we learn from other cultures which appear to value and revere their older, older populations? And how can this be translated into design? And I'm just reminded there of a very quick story of my, from my mother, who said in the village um, that she came from, they didn't have a word for dementia. Um, you know, it was, if, if someone would wander off, you know, they would be found by the nearest 13 year old or the nearest person. Um, so who wants to take that question on cultural differences around aging? Cultural attitudes, I should say, to aging. Sarah? Yeah. Um, so I, I, as Lynn says, I'm a demographer, but I started as an anthropologist. And, and so th that's exactly, I suppose, what started framing what my interests were. Um, I think I think what is really, really interesting, um, you, and it was eventually when, when you just talked about um, your village and um, how they didn't have this word for dementia. Um, one of the things that we have to be clear, I think a lot of even Asian societies are quite ageist when it comes to really late life and elder abandonment has been recognized across all cultures. But I think the one thing that we need to learn, particularly in the West, is around intergenerations because we live in such a segregated society. And I think it is age segregation that has led to this feeling of older people as the other. And that is where often the negative connotations come from. Um, and if you look at some of these societies where uh, older people tend to be respected and valued as individuals, it's because they live in more integrated societies. Families tend to live together in multi-generational houses, or even if they're not living in the same house, they're living in the same community. Um, and, and something that um, Lady Hamlin said right at the beginning, um, and I, I mentioned a little, that's why I think it's really important. The other big thing that Oxford is doing is working on intergenerational communities because the way to tackle a lot of the issues that we've been talking about, to really reduce ageism, to have understanding of what these transitions across the life course are, and that an older person is just, you know, like any other person, um, is to have people living in these, and working, importantly, and learning in these intergenerational communities. Thank, yes, thank you, Sarah. And the, you know, your work as an anthropologist sort of really rings true, because there is some pushback from some studies that I've read that, you know, um, ageism exists, but it just deploys in different ways. Um, anyone else want to come in on that? I, I would just add, I would just completely agree with Sarah. And I, and I do think that this is um, um, a place where we mustn't just focus on kind of pro consumer products and services. This is an area whereby, um, you know, the, the neighborhoods, our cities, our transport systems can really come together to kind of, you know, really kind of have an environment which brings people together and connects them around interests and desires and what people enjoy doing. And age is almost irrelevant in that. Um, so kind of looking at kind of some of the passion economy, for example, where, you know, people are connected on what they love doing. And actually, we need more of that. Um, so I think there's a real role for kind of, um, you know, investment in our kind of um, both our homes, but also our um, connectivity, which will which will really kind of transcend um, the traditional kind of segregation on the basis of age. And, and I think just just to add into that, I think it's a really important point that actually, if you look at companies like Sky TV, who in sort of 15 years ago invested ten, tens to hundreds of millions of pounds in an accessible set top box, um, you know, that worked well for consumers, their marketing strategy was not let's target people age 70. It was let's target people who like football or natural history. Um, you would never think about trying to use age as a basis for these sorts of, you know, marketing in this yeah. space. You just need to make sure your product works, is accessible and attracts the, you know, is relevant to the interests of the people who want to use them. So we've got, um, I'm going to keep the questions flowing. We've got a question from Amanda McGillan, who asks, what current integrated or inclusive design research and innovation areas are looking specifically at gender differences as we age? Um, and what examples are out there? So I know the panel may need a moment to think about this. 
Um, so I'll just say one sentence whilst we're thinking about it. You know, when we talk at the Helen Hamlin Center about these four innovation axes of age, ability, gender, and race, if you take one of them as a primary and the others as qualifiers, um, you start to end up with a really, really interesting research discourse. So if you take race and you start to look at age, gender, and ability um, through the lens of uh, race, um, um, I think questions like this start to come to light. So we're really sort of networking and creating a spider's web here. So um, Lynn, you are unmuted. Yeah. Well, I think it's a great question. And, and I do think it's something when you look at the intersections, you get great learning and sort of insight as to kind of, you know, what, what were you make maybe really positive solutions. Um, just a, 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 sm a small example, um, we're the National Innovation Centre for Ageing. I mentioned we're an international organisation and we look to partner internationally with organisations which are at that interface. And uh, we have a chapter in the East Coast States, which is with a, um, an organisation called Amazing Communities, which looks at the issues of women in work in, um, who are over 45 in terms of the skills they need but also that kind of work care balance that often a lot of women experience and actually looking to um, bring to forward design co-develop really innovative solutions that enable those women um, to kind of make the most of later life and not be kind of held back by kind of, um, you know, stereotypical approaches to skills and um, enabling them to have um, a suite of care products that can enable them with that caring role, be it for children or indeed for older people. Um, and so that, that kind of interface, that kind of intersection it is, is really, really important. So, you know, really welcome kind of any research and any kind of solutions which um, can look at sort of multiple um, factors. And Sarah? Well, I, just really to build on, on what Lynn um, has said, because um, intersectionality is such a big area in research. And yet, Colm, I think we're right that we haven't really focused specifically on that. And, and thank you very much to the question, because I think obviously this is as much about presenting as us learning. And, and I think that has really stimulated some ideas mm -hmm. clearly in Lynn's head and, and in my head. Um, I chair an EU um, sort of review on long-term care across Europe. Um, and the two things in fact, that we look at are ageism and intersectionality. Um, and without any doubt, the design of long-term care facilities has come up. It hasn't been a major focus, but it's there in our report. And, and I think it's you know something that just as Lynn was talking about the living environment and housing and transport, uh, definitely long-term care facilities are incredibly ageist. And, and maybe, Colin, this is something that you know we need to put on our agenda going forward. So thank you to whoever it was who raised it. And can um, I? Yeah. Oh, go on, Colin. Sorry. Colin then David. Yeah, and I, I think it's absolutely right. I mean, uh, this is not an excuse, but we're you know we're, we've only just started our journey. Uh, and we're still looking for agendas and, and, and topics to work on. And I think this is definitely one that we've, we've talked about internally. Uh, and we're looking for formal sort of funding opportunities to say, right, what could we apply this to? And there is a, a grant out there at the minute, you know, for inclusive design and aging. And this is maybe the perfect one to look at it is to look at, right, it's about uh, how do you include the whole of society, every different aspect in the aging conversation and journey. So there's so there's opportunities and, and yeah, it hasn't been high in our agenda as we as we've tried to launch ourselves and build a team, but it, it is one of these things that yeah, we definitely have in our agenda going forward. So thank you. David? Um, I was just gonna say, I think um, really, really important. Um, David Metz did some work a few years ago, probably about 20 years ago now, where he looked at grip strength. And one of the things that's really interesting, if you look at grip strength of say men in their seventies compared with women in their thirties, actually you may well find that men are not that far from women in that space. So actually you could argue that gender is a bigger issue than age in terms of physical grip strength, which is really, really important. Um, what's really clear and there's a really interesting book, which I can't remember the name of, the moment which talks about how the world's basically been designed around men and I think we that has to be tackled as part of this issue as part of this challenge although I as, you know since my my midlife hair dye I have discovered the one product in the UK that is designed around women which is the plastic gloves you get given in hair dry are really is really really tiny um, but actually that's pretty much it so if we can move on from that to everything else being designed around women then I suspect we can also just that the, doing that would also support designing for age. So we're we're um, coming to the end of 
uh, you know, the panel discussion, I want to end with two, two questions. One is for Tim, and then the other is for the, for the panel. Um, and they're both from Hua Dong. Um, so the question for Tim is how, how can attitudes be changed by design? Well, that's the role of public platform, isn't it? And, and you, if you think of the quality of questions and insight that we're, we're getting uh, from each other and from outside, or just on this discussion, you realise that by showcasing, by staging exhibitions, by show, show, showcasing displays, the conversation and, and coming together physically. Uh, I mean, we'll have to do more of this digitally as well because it, it gives us a bit broader access. But the way we change attitude is by showcasing, discussing, focusing. And so uh, that, that, I mean, that isn't a plug for the Design Museum. It's why it's so important that there is a partnership in, in the Design Institute that looks at the public dissemination of research and an ongoing conversation. So that would be my answer. Thank you. And it leads beautifully into the uh, another question from Hua, which takes us into a personal realm for the panellists. And she says, I'd like to ask all panellists, what is the most important lesson that you've learned in your engagement with ageing research and design? I can see the eyes rolling upwards. <laughs> not, not in indignation, but in thought. Colin, I was hoping you might go first. I'll go first. Um, optimism. You know, um, when, I, when I studied product design at Chelsea School of Art, all those, whatever it was, 34 years ago, whatever it was, um, it was fed to us that our role was to change the world. That's your job as a designer, is to change the world. Maybe only one sort of razor at a time, um, you know, or one high street retail out there, or one pack of sweets at a time but your job is to change things and, and change the world slowly and when I again when I was a student you know I took on a Royal Society of Art design brief that was about child safety products and most of my peers thought I was I was a bit mad why are you doing that they're all doing radios and, and fan heaters and, and, and the like um, and that's changed completely my daughter is now at design college in Loughborough and everybody in her class are excited about the environment and socially responsible design and so the world has changed in that in those 30 years and I think there's huge cause for optimism in this that design can have a voice and a role to play in changing people's attitudes around age and ageism. Thank you so we have optimism on the table what else does anyone want to put on Lynn? I guess I, mean, I would also put optimism, but I think as well, um, you know, we've talked a lot about wisdom and experience. And I think one of the one of the areas that I've learned is that let's utilize the intelligence that we have, the aging intelligence that we have sensibly. Let's not duplicate effort, reinvent the wheel, work fragmentally in, in glorious silos. Let's come together. And I think one of the powerful um, you know, possibilities of this partnership is that you've got, you know, four major organisations working closely together in partnership. And, and I think that's when we will get the big step forward. And so I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about that. <laughs> you've started a trend here, Colin. <laughs> Who wishes to go next? Go on, I'll, I'll jump in. I think the, the big one I would say is that uh, overused phrase, perhaps, but that we're, we have a habit of overestimating short term change and underestimating the long term. And equally, we, you know, linking into Colin's point, we do sort of forget that we have seen some progress. That said, and I think this is where the exciting opportunity is, you know, I, you know, I, it is unbelievably frustrating that I look back at slides I gave 20 years ago at Help the Aged and frankly can still present the same arguments. Um, we, you know, we have failed to adapt to ageing. Um, we, we are in complete denial of it and actually, you know, the reality is, we're, you know, unless, coming back to the first point about global, unless we look to place, you know, really push ahead, we're going to look be looking to places like Singapore and South Korea who are going through pretty rapid aging who will go way way ahead of us thank you david um in the integration i mean I, i've learned hugely today just about i mean integration intersectionality intergenerationalism all these things are critically important but i think the the, the overarching thing is that it's it's an ongoing saga and that's that's what will play against complacency that you know, we won't resolve language it will keep needing to be resolved we won't resolve design it will keep evolving uh, but we need to do better but i just put a little kind of postscript in which is that I, that 
I find the way that the, that the subject is discussed broadly and specifically has a lot of really good natured humor to it. And that's important because it, it's not it doesn't trivialize it at all and it's a very serious matter and we need to give it serious concern but so much uh, of the of the social politics that takes place in our society at the moment is done in such a confrontational way uh, and, and I, I i mean I, I salute the need for that but at the same time i think we gain much more when we do things in, in, with better nature so I, I like the humor and there's no one better there's no group better he said now plummeting into stereotypes uh, of self-awareness than um, the mature people talking about their life experiences. Sometimes it's incredibly powerful and moving, but it's done with often with great, great grace and humour. And, and uh, we need a bit of that in the way we approach the design uh, solutions to that, I think, too. So self-awareness, a really important word. Sarah? Um, I, I'm actually just going to build uh, on almost what everyone said. So um, uh, as I think Jeremy said at the beginning, I met Jeremy about 15 years ago, actually in a swimming pool, which we don't have to go any further with that, in Singapore, <laughs> talking about ageing. Um, and this design for our future selves just really transformed how, how we began to look. And we now talk about preparing for our future selves, preparing individuals, preparing societies. So we learned an awful lot just from that, that concept. Um, I think we also learned uh, a lot looking at um, how you designers used, if you like, the voice and the individual experience. And as I say, I, I started as an anthropologist who was used to ethnography and case studies, moved into demography and always had the intellectual idea of how do you take big quantitative surveys and then integrate it with small scale qualitative work. But we learned a tremendous amount from the Helen Hamlin Center about how you did this. Um, and, and so I would say it is, um, I'm very positive about the way that this, the Design Age Institute, it's multidisciplinary, it's cross-sectional, we have policymakers, practitioners, researchers, all working together with different types of material, including the voice uh, of people across the life course, um, to really understand not only how we're going to design, but also prepare for our future selves. And that is a beautiful final um, or semi-final word, because um, just to round off this, I'm going to ask you all for a single word or a phrase, which is just what do you associate with your future self? So building on the exercise with George, we want to hear from future Tim, future Lynn, future David, future Sarah and future Colin. And the spirit of art, not asking you to do anything I'm not prepared to do myself, my future phrase would be sense of self because it links my personal truth to a universal one. So which of the future selves wants to go? Sarah, then Colin. Um, so, so mine um, links back to that wonderful story about, I think it was the Buddhist, that, that my, when I look at old age, I'm looking out from the mountain. Wonderful, Colin. Uh, three letters, joy. That's it really. What, what could be more important to have a bit of joy in every day of your life? And as long as you're getting that, then so it's about the pursuit of joy. And I'm so glad you made, you know, it made it into the title of this session. <laughs> Lynn? I think intelligence and happiness would be, would be mine. Um, so, you know, utilizing all that cumulative intelligence um, and um, ultimately people are living happy, fulfilled lives. Truly ageless, um, Lynn, thank you. Tim? Energy. Uh, I want to keep energised and energetic and energising those around me and taking their energy as well. That's what I hope. <laughs> I think that's, that's beautiful and yogic at the same time. Um, David, future uh, David, you have I, the final I word. Really, I, I'm finding it really hard to think beyond the green room I've sat in for the last year and a half. But actually, for, so for the short term, frankly, getting out there and seeing some bloody live music, frankly, the future me is at a concert. And actually, by the time I get to my 70s, I want to still be at Glastonbury. And ideally, we've got premiere in in the news today. Ideally, we could have a little premiere in on site so I haven't got to sleep in the tent. But, you know, that my future me is absolutely about, you know, the return of music and arts that makes sort of it all worthwhile. And I think in there from the green room is a little vignette of aging right there and our personal attributions and aspirations. So thank you all to the panel, a big Zoom round of applause.
Um, I'm told this is how we clap on Zoom. <laughs> so thank you so much. And thank you for your partnership on this journey, um, your support, your generosity and your comradeship. And we look forward to working with you. If we could, um, if I could ask um, Ava, our wonderful illustrator, to uh, come online and just share with us some of the work that you've been doing behind the scenes. We're curious to see. Hi, Roman. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you so much. And also, it's been super wonderful to listen to this event and <laughs> to get us inspired while I've been working. Um, I'll try to share my screen and share uh, what I've been working on so far. Okay, hopefully you all can see this. Um, so I've been um, turning the objects of joy that everyone submitted into um, a series of visualizations. So I've created kind of a, a poster uh, to document uh, the event and we'll also send these after so um, people can print them out and take them home. Um, yeah, so <laughs> these are the objects of joy. Um, quite literally represented what um, people submitted. I've uh, created two because there are so many. Um, and uh, what's really been interesting to see is that uh, for most of them, uh, they are all like um, representing kind of activities uh, that uh, people want to do or aspirations. Um, there's a lot of things in here where, um, you know, about learning new things through online classes, doing daring or exciting things like winter swimming or beekeeping, uh, also making objects that allow you to make things like 3D printers, um, sewing machines, uh, etc. And there was a lot about also enjoying uh, nature and being aware of um, the changing seasons, um, about growing your own vegetables uh, and gardens. So it was really wonderful to see. Uh, and lastly, objects that connect uh, are about connection, connecting with others. So cooking with friends, um, celebrating things, um, etc. So yeah, that <laughs> all in all, that was, it's been really good to see and uh, um, we'll be sure to share this with you um, after the session. I'm so looking forward to this, Ava. And I think we must put this on the wall of our fourth floor that's being built as we are all um, um, sitting in our living rooms because it's such an inspirational piece. And I think I'm gonna shamelessly take inspiration uh, for this for my future self. So the um, so thank you for turning that around so quickly. You know, the power of design um, really comes through there. So, Colm, um, in the next 10 to 15 minutes or so, can you introduce to us some calls to action that um, people can participate in? Yes, I'm going to introduce you to three members of my team or four members of my team um, who are going to talk about three ways that uh, people can get involved in the Design Age Institute almost immediately. Um, you will meet again Victoria, our impact manager, who's going to talk us through uh, the Design Age directory. I'll then introduce you to George, uh, George Lee, who I've talked about already, who's our community lead, and he will talk about this age thing um, for our ageing activists. Um, but first and foremost, I would like you to introduce you to um, our senior design managers on a job share, Fiona and Andy, um, and they will talk to you about our Pathfinder projects. And it's one of the things we're quite proud of at the Design Age Institute, that um, we have about 70 plus years of design management experience um, to help people. So um, Fiona, over to you. Okay, um, thank you, Colin. And thank you for everybody to everybody this morning. It's been the most wonderful discussion that I think is already moving all of our thinking yeah. on. And um, yes, Andy and myself are doing our first ever job share because we want to both um, experiment and experience new ways of working because that's flexible working is something that an aging population is going to need. And we are working on bringing about 16 Pathfinder projects to market. Um, it could be 16, it could be 10 larger projects. And the projects are very much about finding a pathway from prototype to market. We very much want to open up the longevity economy and create pathways for others to follow. And very much as Lady Hellman was asking us for, bringing it actually to market on shelves in the design museum. 
Um, we already have a pipeline. We have some interesting projects, but we have capacity for many more. So please do get in touch if you have a relevant prototype you would like design help with. And we are looking at addressing both aspects of health and happiness. As Colin has been saying this morning, you know, being lonely and socially isolated does affect your health. They're intrinsically linked. And we've started with six innovation platforms and they can evolve. And actually they are evolving from all of the wonderful discussion we've been having this morning. And the first is about increasing mobility. We've heard a lot about that. And actually there's so many people in the UK who reject mobility devices because they're stigmatizing and they stay at home and live lesser lives. So we very much want to get better mobility as close to the forms of transport that people normally use, better accessibility for all. Behind me is the Centre project. It's one of our first Pathfinder projects. It's um, a more attractive wheelchair that rises and falls so you're on eye level with people. We're working on bringing this to market within the next year. Um, healthier for longer? Absolutely. How can we devices, gyms, exercise, everything to get people healthier? How can we have enabling homes? Both, I mean, we're looking at prototypes for homes, both for the multi-generational home, for um, working at home, to stay independent and age in place for longer more socially connected. Yes, right at a master plan level, right down to engaging more with people, passing by and community. Yes, how can we help people stay at work for longer, for as long as they want to? And yes, so that they're financially better off and we have better tailored financial services and products for the aging population. So yes, we're working across these innovation platforms. We're happy to evolve it and do more. So please do get in touch if you've got a prototype that you'd like to discuss with us. And now Andy, um, my job share is going to talk about more what we can offer you on these projects. Thanks Fiona, hello everyone. Um, so as you probably heard, from all of our speakers this morning, one of the things that we're really, really proud of within the Institute is the really fortunate position we find ourselves in having such a wide range of experience, both within the team and within our wider partnerships. So we would like to offer that experience and the opportunity to collaborate with you uh, out to the market. So we can access resources both internally and externally. Collaboration is what we want to be doing. Um, in co-creation and in moving things forward to Lady Hamlin's point from earlier and really making sure that great ideas get to become uh, both access accessible in the marketplace and successful. One of the most important things, of course, we can bring is some seed funding. So if you're at a stage where you have um, a prototype or a, a, a proof of concept, then please, please do come and talk to us because we've got budget that we can help take a, a significant step with that project towards the market. Um, we've got access through uh, voice and other groups for user really um, focused and intelligent user groups. And of course, we can access lots of academic um, research too. And Tim has mentioned a number of times about the shop window opportunity and the dissemination uh, from our partners at the Design Museum. So that uh, is something that we really, really look forward to being able to do once we're at that position. So to conclude, whoever you are from whatever background, if you're a designer, an architect, maybe a manufacturer, an interested individual or an academic, then please, please do get in touch with us. Uh, we'd love to have a conversation with you. Um, our email address and our, our website are there at the bottom of the page. And uh, we also, um, within the feedback form that will be sent out at the end of the event, uh, there's an opportunity to pop in um, a contact uh, there, then, and we'd be delighted to come back to you. So one of the things we can do, um, which I'm going to pass on to my colleague, Victoria, is about matchmaking designers and businesses. So she's now going to talk to you about the Design Age directory. Over to you, Victoria. Thank you, Andy. Um, as Andy said, I'm Victoria and I'm the impact manager for the Design Age Institute. And I'm really delighted to share the Design Age directory 
the UK's first directory showcasing and celebrating skills and expertise in design for healthy aging. So the directory will not only connect industry with UK design talent, but will also support aging communities by identifying the key people, products and services that can help every one of us to age happier and healthier. So today we're calling on all UK designers with expertise in design for aging and inclusive design to join the directory. It's totally free, it's easy to join, and we will be using it to connect potential clients with designers. So if you are a designer, um, you can, by joining, you'll be able to connect with industry, share with your peers, highlight your skills and expertise, and join a growing community of experts in design for aging. If you're looking for design talent, you can already find a number of leading design agencies listed on the directory with expertise in architecture, digital, interiors, product design, service design, graphic design, fashion, research, and more. You can visit designage.org to check it out, and we're going to pop the link into the chat now. So I would encourage all of you to go and have a look around and to get involved. Now over to George. Hello everyone, it's me again. I'm um, I um, I'm not shouting. I'm not shouting. I promise you. I'm just passionate. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, this age thing. Um, so I'm just going to uh, make sure I don't go on too long. You'd be glad to know that. So okay, let me tell you about this age thing. So this age thing is a community created by all of us for all of us. Um, it's been seeded by the Design Age Institute, which is wonderful, but it is not owned by them. It is our community. As aging activists, and we are all aging activists, it's our community. And the age things go this simple. It's to unite us as we age, um, because aging is the one thing which we all have in common. So it's a community where we can all come together. We've talked about the power of collaboration and we can all come together to help redesign a world where we can all live longer, healthier, and of course, joyfully. So how do we get there? It's about joining forces. It's about industry, government, the media, citizens, old and young, and of course, you, every single person in this room, we want to, all of you signing up and for you to share, share the age thing with everyone. So exactly what it is it. So the age thing is the community to share the millions of positive stories about getting older. And there are millions of them. But it's also the community to share the stories that make us angry. So this is where I might get a little bit shirty. And to strive for justice and equality as we age. It's also the community where we are listened to, where our collective rich lived experience is valued. As, as Lynn and the voice of, uh, um, talked about earlier, we have so much lived experience to share and, and to educate and be listened to. It's also the community to co-create solutions that respond to the challenges and opportunities that age can bring. It's the community to enable us all to live longer, healthier and more joyful lives. It's also the community to help end ageism and the community to make real change. So, you know, we've got, a, we've got some, some, you know, a lot of things we want to achieve with it. So we need all of us. So if you have a story which you think can inspire people to age with agency and with joy, then please join this community. But also, if you have a challenge which you want the government or industry or designers to take seriously, then join this community. If you have an idea which you think will change the world, then join this community. Let's combine our collective voices and make the world better for all of us. So we posted the link um, in the chat. Um, it's starting off with a very, very simple website. It's got a few stories to inspire you. But over the next months and years, and through both virtual and hopefully soon face-to-face -face gatherings and through collective lived experience research, we will together be able to influence the new products and the services and the places to live and work, which will change all our lives for the better. So I'm encouraging every single one of you before you, before you leave today, go to thisagething.co and join up today because actually your future starts now. So, and it starts with you. So please join us. Thank you. Over to you, Rama. Thank you, um, George and um, Colm and uh, the team. 
Um, I think there's a lot of things there that, you know, if you haven't, um, if you need your fix of aging um, and if you um, want to um, uh, engage with us and we really encourage you to, as George said, it's the lifeblood of this institute. So it just falls on me to give a few brief thank yous and they will be brief before I hand over to Jeremy to lead us off. Um, I do want to thank our partners, the Oxford Institute of Population Aging, the Design Museum, the International Longevity Centre, and the National Innovation Centre for Aging at Newcastle, and particularly my colleagues at the Helen Hamlin Centre for Design, um, particularly Dr Chris McGinley, who worked on the bid. Um, our thanks go to Research England, who funded this vision and institute, to Helen and her trust, who have been a long time supporter um, in every single way for this work, for this inclusive work. To Paul Thompson, Naren Barfield and Emma Wakelin at the RCA, who have created this space to grow this ambitious but necessary endeavor. A huge thanks go to the wonderful DAI staff who put this together. There's many, too many of you to mention, but particularly Colm, Melanie Smith, Victoria, and Rosina, um, all of whom worked tires, tirelessly to bring this together. I think the Design Age team went from um, zero members of staff to from zero to hero, as my uncle would say, in a matter of months. Um, in, and putting this particular event together, vibrant and rich event, um, is no mean feat when you've never met each other and when you're working off a screen and images the size of a postage stamp. So the future really looks bright and full of joy with all of you as part of the Hamlin family and part of the RCA community. Um, I do want to take a note to thank all of you who have joined us today, the hundreds of you, because you are what will make this a success. We need your passion, your purpose, your engagement, and your voice, and as Tim said, your energy. I also want to take a moment to remember the thousands of participants of all ages who have inspired our work and continue to do so. We simply would not be here without them. And we see them very much as partners on this journey, not as test subjects, not as users or consumers, but as people. Because as we always say, users use, consumers consume, but people live. So today is, we're ending the session, but it's the beginning of a trajectory, of a conversation, of an energy flow. And um, we look forward to walking on this journey with you. So my final words are, please inject a little joy into your every day. Do something that makes you smile. And that is a piece of wisdom that someone told me that I wish to take forward with me as I explore my future self. So Jeremy, if I can hand over to you in the closing minutes, just for, for, for the final reflections. Oh, thank you, Rama. Uh, I think this has been a really uh, rich and dynamic conversation, which has exposed many of the fault lines uh, of this debate. Um, and there've been so many highlights, but you know, I've just kind of, um, looking back over the last couple of hours, you know, do we shout or do we whisper on aging issues? Are we designing for the inclusive mainstream or special needs? Are we addressing functional deficits of aging or are we heading for emotional truths and aspirations? Are we addressing a medical model of aging or a social, a cultural model of aging? Are we just designing products or are we going to, as Jackie Marshall Cyrus said on the chat, we should be heading for service and systems design? And finally, do we normalize aging or do we treat it as an exception, unprecedented in human history? I don't know the answer to all these, but it shows the complexity of, of, of the scene in, in which we're operating. Um, but I would leave everybody with um, the thing that Helen Hamlin said, um, and she has uh, initiated and driven this whole story of design for aging over the past 35 years. When she designed 
um, when she curated the new design uh, for old exhibition, she wanted to get things moving, get things to the market, make things happen. So my uh, um, final comment uh, for all of you today and the Design Age Institute team and the Helen Hamlin team, let's get things moving. Thank you.